That's a big one, too. Exactly. So we're really excited to celebrate here with you. So Thank you. Can we all sing happy birthday no. to <laughs> No pressure, OK? And a one, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear John. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> and wow. on top of that, wow. we have a beautiful cake that is also the design, as you can see back here, who our former host Jen designed. Um, so happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. And That's lovely. There you go. All right. <laughs> and I'll let you take it from there. There we go. Without further ado. All right. So uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, we live within an incredible waste stream, and we as Americans think everything comes from the store and then it goes down a hole somewhere. We have no idea uh, where it comes from, where it goes to. And you know, this is a problem, and this is something that we have to change. Uh, we're surrounded by the cast-off pieces of our, our culture. Uh, our first building, which is uh, mostly known as Bubbly Dynamics or the Chicago Sustainable Manufacturing Center, which is way too long and nobody calls it that, started as a paint warehouse in the Central Manufacturing District, which is the nation's first planned industrial park about 1898. So this building, when I bought it, was a motorcycle junkyard, and it was occupied uh, by some crazy people like Santa Claus, uh, Googs, the Boob, and Cowboy. Cowboy's in prison for life now. He ratted out Joe Calabrese, the noted mafioso, uh, and so he's in um, protective custody. Uh, but Santa Claus was a good guy, and he, um, we did a lot of trades, and so I would give him my scrap metal, and he would bring me things like acetylene torches or pallet racks or whatever I needed. So uh, in renovating a building like that, 100-year-old building, uh, there's a lot of demolition, there's a lot of work to do, and I at the time was working in television. I didn't have time to do it, but I made time in the evenings and on weekends, and then I brought in my friends. And we trained a lot of people how to build things. And so this is one of my neighbors from across the street. Uh, and uh, as we got farther and farther into the project, the skills required became more and more intense. And so this fellow, Yuval Oatsu, is welding together salvaged pieces from a brewery uh, and some restaurant sinks uh, that aren't visible there uh, in the lobby for the, for the bubbly handrails, for instance. Uh, so that building is home to 16 small businesses that are uh, fabricators, woodworkers, printers, uh, uh, maker space, a variety of different uses, uh, and uh, has been full right through the whole recession because we created a community of people that wanted to be there and wanted to work together, which is key to this, uh, and uh, is making that community where people go across the hall if somebody else has work, et cetera. So in order to make the project fun and bring in loads of volunteers, uh, we did some fun things, like put a green roof on the building. That's my daughter Zoe when she was a baby. And on the right side is the printing diagram. So we went down like a big uh, printer and printed 9,600 sedum plants, each of which is a pixel in her image. And, uh, and so there's the <laughs> Google Maps image of Zoe. Hi, Zoe. So uh, when that project was done, I was casting about, what do we do next? Where do we go? And so the, the hardest kind of space to develop is food business space, trying to make spaces for companies that uh, have very high requirements in terms of inspections and uh, wash down surfaces and all of this. So I bought a former meat packing plant in back of the yards uh, that's just shy of 100,000 square feet, has uh, floor drains throughout it, uh, and uh, was uh, occupied until 2007 in the production of pork, uh, bacon, hams, that sort of thing. 
and so um, we launched right into salvaging materials within. So here we are cutting up smokehouses and repurposing the parts of them for other, other uses. Uh, it's dirty work and it goes on for a long time. This fellow is a professor at IIT, actually. He's also pretty good with the jackhammer. Uh, and uh, because the, the building was cut up in crazy ways. The broker that I bought it through described it as a pile and a strip and rip, meaning you strip the stainless steel out and you rip it down, and that was the perceived value. So I looked at it and I said, wow, that's actually uh, got a tremendous amount of embodied energy in the concrete, the steel, the mechanical systems, what was left of them, uh, the insulation, because this is a refrigerated building. And so we can do a lot with that. So here we are repurposing structural steel, which we welded together in a new shape and then lowered it down one roof level and put a bunch of chillers on top of it. Uh, so repairing brick floors. So the building is filled with gorgeous dairy brick floors, which are incredibly expensive if you have to install them. But if they're there, they can be restored for fairly little money. This is that same floor in what's now uh, a room filled with cheese, artisanal cheese. Uh, and, um, and so this actually is the same room that you saw earlier that looked all cruddy. Uh, and so as we go through, we're repurposing things like the evaporators that are hanging in there. We switched those over to glycol from ammonia so that we don't have a toxic inhalation hazard. Ammonia is a great refrigerant, but it's dangerous. So uh, now we're running glycol through that same system. Uh, we built an oven here that, or actually we didn't do it, outside people built a wood-fired oven for, uh, for breads and pizzas and other things. Uh, this is Kaylee Donawald, and so she is also a corporate refugee. She was at Deloitte too, she's a consultant, and now she runs Sacred Serve, uh, making vegan gelato, really high quality stuff, all coconut based. Uh, Rhea Neary is, uh, owns two businesses actually at the plant. She's a partner in Weiner Beer Company, and then she also owns Four Letter Word Coffee Roasting, so very high quality stuff, and she's also a designer. Uh, like me, she came from a computer graphics background and animation. Uh, so, Again, the work is dirty. This is what's now the brewery space, and we're tearing up a floor, a beautiful brick floor that was uh, laid over cork insulation, and then they drove forklifts all over it, Pure Foods did, the previous owner, and cracked it to bits. And so anytime we put water on the floor, it went down into the lighting fixtures in the grow room below. That was kind of bad, so we had to tear it out and put in a, a, a membrane, a roof, basically, and pour a new floor. So uh, 24 businesses now at the plant, uh, ranging from cheese, coffee, as we already named those, uh, five, six indoor farms, a couple more outdoor farms, um, a slew of different uh, uh, producers, chocolate making, bread, pizzas, that kind of thing. Uh, this is part of the brewery. Brewing is important to us because it's the low-hanging fruit of waste and energy. So it has very easy to recover waste products. So heat is the number one. That's so easy to recover. Uh, we use the carbon dioxide from the fermentation process. We feed it into algae bioreactors. We feed it into grow rooms. Uh, the wastewater is a little bit more difficult because when they wash down, they use, uh, they use detergents and cleaners, and that's a little harder to remove, but we're working on that. Uh, the grain is obviously very easy to reuse, and so uh, you can grow mushrooms on it. Um, at the low end, you can compost it, but you can also bake it into bread. There's a lot of stuff you can do. Uh, so um, Weiner Beer Company, uh, specializes in French and Belgian ales and um, saisons, wonderful beer. Uh, so this is a former loading dock that's now our lobby. So we designed this all with salvaged, internally salvaged material. The entire structure of the ramp uh, was internally salvaged from the building. Uh, now we have a wetland in there that recycles wastewater from just ice. They're in the basement. They make super fancy ice cubes. Uh, in, a, uh, in an environmentally, it's a stupid product, but they make it in an environmentally conscious way. Um, and they hire from the neighborhood, they hire from Englewood and back of the yards, which is great. Uh, and so we take a lot of their wastewater and feed it to our plants. And the plants and the fish and the turtles that are in there uh, clean that water essentially for us. Uh, so uh, we just recently built the Packingtown Museum. It's not quite done yet. It's partially open <laughs> where we're celebrating labor and immigration history. You know? So back of the yards has been a port of entry since the 1860s. And so every nationality under the sun came through the packing houses and worked. And they were the low people on the totem pole at some point. And the packers would work hard to foment hatred basically between different ethnicities in order to keep labor from organizing. And so uh, we're trying to lay as much of that bare as we possibly can and what the American experience of coming here uh, was like. 
uh, and uh, how immigrants built Chicago and continue to build Chicago is a very important concept in the museum. Also the eight hour day, don't forget that. Uh, so our winter garden is, uh, is fairly new space. This was exterior, a lot of it, and then there were several smoke houses that we repurposed into the break room. We host events in here, we do, we had the, um, the launch of the, um, what is it, oh crap, never mind. We'll move. <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, degrow movement, sorry, degrowth movement, which is a different economic system where instead of continuous growth and relying on continuous growth, we're actually looking for a more sustainable economic model that doesn't require everything to constantly grow. And that's kind of an important concept. So we're looking for small, we're looking for local, and we're looking to cycle money back within the community, which is an important concept because uh, when big companies take it, it all goes somewhere out and it leaves the community. Uh, so we have a little kitchen in there. Everything in here is salvaged. Everything was salvaged. We uh, welded the sink basins into, which are salvaged from a McMansion in Barrington into a stainless table, for instance. Um, and so the space gets used constantly f uh, by people in the building as a break room, et cetera. Um, our anaerobic digester, which you can see the corner of out there, uh, we'll get to in a moment. Uh, but the heart of the, the loop closing is that digester. So we try as hard as we can to work with uh, organizations and people within the community to, uh, to bring them in and not make them think that we're some crazy spaceship from the north side that has landed uh, because we're, you know, we're trying to be good partners in our neighborhood, which, is, which can be harder than it sounds, actually. Uh, farmers markets, first Saturday of every month, uh, where products from the building and outside the building and from neighborhood businesses come in. So I talked a little bit about closing loops. The more we can close, the better. And so we're not looking for 100% here. What we're looking to do is to shave some cost for a local business by even 5% is significant. So we're trying to create economies of scale for small businesses that help them compete with large businesses. Uh, and so that can be um, even just handling somebody's disposal for them taking care of the engineering of uh, maintaining temperatures in their space or refrigeration. Any of those things will help a small business. So wherever we can, we're looking for new ways to loop back around. Uh, and, um, and like I say, they can be just little things, but little things add up. Uh, here's the anaerobic digester being installed. Ultimately, we'll consume 32 tons per day of biomass that will come from neighboring food businesses, uh, primarily industrial scale food waste, uh, which is going into landfills right now, or in some cases composting facilities, but those facilities are way outside of town. So uh, we are looking to um, turn all of that waste into energy, is one of the things, heat energy in our case, um, and uh, solid digestate, which is kind of like compost and it can be sold as a soil amendment. Uh, but the hard one is liquid digestate, because that's too aqueous to be worth trucking very far. Uh, and so uh, the value of it is based on how much nitrogen is in it. Uh, NPK, nit nitrogen, um, potassium, phosphorus, sorry. Uh, and um, if you can't get that value at the farm because you spent too much money trucking it, now you have a negative value. And so what we've decided to do and what we're working with Arizona State University on is um, what we call valorizing the liquid digestate or adding value to it or taking value out of it really uh, by growing algaes. And so uh, the algaes that we're working with are initially extremophile algaes, meaning they, are, uh, they can live in a very hot environment in this case to remove pathogens from that waste product. And then we'll be growing high value food grade algaes like chlorella, uh, porphyridium, uh, galdiaria is one of the ones we're using. Uh, that can then be inputs to food manufacturing or even nutraceuticals. And so we're trying to come up with ways to make anaerobic digestion actually profitable because the whole point of this is that we're creating a replicable model. And the idea of a replicable, mo replicable model is that other people are going to take it and run with it. And it's great if you're a nonprofit and you get foundation money and you do something really cool, but it's completely different if you're a small business and you actually make money by behaving responsibly then you have proven something, and then other people will take that and they'll expand on it. And that's what we're trying to do here. So um, the farms within the building are primarily small businesses, uh, and uh, some of whom are hoping to grow to very large scale. There's a lot of different approaches to it. 
Uh, and so we're supporting with engineering and, and assistance wherever we can the six different indoor farms, but they all have very different methodologies. Some of them are uh, extremely high tech and others are very much hand operated. So uh, closed loop farms down in the basement started in a space that was about 100 square feet, so a little tiny 10 by 10 spot delineated by some rusting lockers and some pallet racks uh, for $75 a month. And uh, that was only a couple of years ago and now they are in 3,600 square feet and employing 13 people from Back of the Yards and Englewood uh, and working seven days a week delivering to 150 restaurants. Uh, so we're pretty proud of, of that and that's a very different style uh, of, uh, of growing and it's a, um, there's no investment, you know, there was no money from outside, no loans, nothing like that, just creative people building something. Uh, so mushrooms are a good one to do inside of a building also because we can take advantage of the, uh, the cool and the, the even temperatures in a giant concrete building uh, and they grow on waste, it's a handy thing. So we try very hard to show people what we're doing and teach, uh, teach kids, teach adults. Uh, frankly, though, mostly we're interested in teaching adults. We're interested in elected officials, engineers, architects, designers, because those are the people that can have the greatest effect on climate change now, uh, as opposed to children who, you know, it's good to bake these concepts into, tr into children, but right now we're in the middle of a crisis and we need to do something fast. So, um, so that's one of the things we try to do is, is talk as much as we can, invite elected officials in and beat them over the head basically with whatever we can and say you need to act now. So uh, here you can see our, our uh, smokehouse bathrooms. These are converted stainless steel smokehouses. You saw us torching these up earlier. Uh, and on the right hand side is uh, looking through a former smoke vent up into the winter garden above. So we try to grow plants in little nooks all over the building. Uh, and so this is from looking down from the winter garden floor uh, to see the ferns growing beneath. So a, a, a big smokestack used to come out of there. Uh, so uh, the, main, the main focus for Bubbly Dynamics right now is, uh, is lab work. Uh, so we're doing cellular agriculture, uh, which means growing things like meats from scratch in petri dishes. Uh, that is generally done uh, using bovine uh, uh, stem cells. So what we're working on is a way to use algae and algae derivatives to replace any of the meat in those lab-grown meats. So the goal of this is the protein, not to make meat, but to make protein uh, in the most efficient ways possible. And so uh, in this case, that uh, orangish peach colored thing is a uh, bioreactor that's growing uh, chicken. It's growing mycelial chicken. Uh, and so that was kind of a fun project. Uh, it was MRG Labs. Uh, and so we, um, we built this entire laboratory out of salvage material from a biotech company that uh, the owner retired in Madison and she sold us three truckloads of uh, research equipment, scientific equipment, clean room stuff uh, for a, a pathetically small amount of money and, uh, and we repurposed all of that stuff. Uh, and so that's a big challenge for us but uh, it put us into a new realm of being able to do this uh, cellular agriculture and other life sciences work uh, within the building. Uh, so one of the other things that we're doing now is extracting phycocyanin. So it's a blue protein that comes from uh, spirulina or chlorella algae. And so phyco is a, um, it's high in protein, it's also a growth stimulant for plants. And we have found about a 25% increase in rates of growth for indoor agriculture. So when you're talking about growing basil or microgreens in a building, your biggest expense is electricity and then real estate costs the space and the cost of the space. So if you can speed up a crop by 25%, you are cutting the electricity bill and all of those bills down by that much. And so this is one of the ways that we can get small businesses to a point where they're efficient enough to compete. Uh, so locationally, they're great. They're right in the middle of the city. So distribution can happen in the most efficient way possible instead of the standard 1,500 miles that most vegetables travel to come uh, to us here. So this thing that you're looking at is a refractance window dryer that we built and it uses a hot water bath at 98 Celsius and then a mylar film. And so the stuff that's peeling off of it is phycocyanin uh, and uh, we use this dryer to dry other kinds of algae as well. Uh, and um, so the other fun use for phyco is as a blue food coloring, a healthy organic blue food coloring. 
So uh, right now, the holy grail would be M&M Mars and blue M&Ms. And currently, there are more M&Ms produced uh, than, than you can even imagine. And the total world production of phycocyanin is only one-sixth of what would be required to supply M&M Mars just for the M&Ms alone. So this is one of the, the potential directions. So we're looking at this as a way to fund further research. So if we do this project, which we are, uh, we can get enough money from doing that and selling the FICO that we can actually um, pay for more laboratories and expand the, the research functions. So we're building up something called the Whiskey Point Initiative. Uh, we're at Whiskey Point, six corner intersection, all bars, bars down all the streets, back from uh, packing house days. Uh, and, um, and so this new initiative will be focused on food and research. So, um, in summary, uh, small is good. Small is very, very good. Uh, the 24 businesses are, are focused on that kind of local production, cycling that money back within the community as much as possible, uh, and sourcing as locally as possible, or for things like chocolate and coffee, doing direct trade as opposed to fair trade, uh, and making sure that the money stays within small companies. Uh, and so. Uh, my biggest piece, I think, of advice for everybody, and I, I came from the world of um, art directing video games and then working in television, uh, doing set design for, for nine years, um, is to be true to yourself and to your own values and not let large companies take over from you uh, because that's, you know, that's really key. At a certain point, I had to walk away from that industry uh, because I didn't believe in what they were doing anymore, and so that's a key point. End your, <laughs> end your uh, uh, dependence on that and, uh, and do what you believe is right. So, um, so let's see. I'm trying to think of what the other concepts are that are key here. We want to make sure uh, to um, support the people in our neighborhoods as much as possible because to build a healthy city and a sustainable city, uh, we can't just let that money leave. That's really, that's really the biggest single thing. And always looking for ways to combine everything. There's, you know, uh, looking at biomimicry, how nature does things, and saying how can we mimic what nature does because nature knows how to do this stuff way better than we do. So um, with that, I think uh, we're right at the end of the time, correct? Oh. Thank you.